This morning I'd like to look at using breath as a meditation object and I'd like to begin by uh, doing a series of exercises in breathing meditation. Doing these exercises I'll be directing your attention to different aspects of the breathing and the terms that I'll be using will be rising and falling. Rising is code for any movement or sensations that you feel on the inhalation and falling is code for any movement or sensations you feel on the exhalation regardless of where you feel them just to clarify that so if you get into your meditation posture and as always Constructing the posture from the ground up, finding the front of the buttock bones, getting a clear sense of those two points of contact. From those two points of contact, lifting up through the centre of the body. Chest opens up, shoulders back and relax. The muscles relaxed as the lift is up the centre of the body. Lifting all the way up through the top of the head and beyond. So feeling the whole body from floor to ceiling, from the sense of contact at the base and lifting all the way up. And from there, bring the awareness to any sense of movement within the body. Where do you feel movement? Focus in on the part of the body where this movement is clearest and most obvious. Don't be concerned about where it is, just focus on wherever it is. Where is that movement? the movement of the rising and the falling. Is it in the upper body, the lower body? Is it stable or does that place move? Focus in on location. Where are the movements clearest? most obvious. Is it one location or more than one location? There are two movements, the rising and the falling. And movement 
has direction. In what direction are these movements travelling? Is it vertical? Is it horizontal? Is it circular? Is it cone shaped? Focus on direction. In what direction are these movements travelling? Movement also has length. Of the two movements, the rising and the falling, which one is longer? Which one is shorter? Is the rising longer or shorter than the falling? Is the falling longer or shorter than the rising? Or are they equally long or equally short? Focus on length. How long are these movements?
there are two movements, the rising and the falling. Which one is clearer? Is the rising clearer than the falling? Or is the falling clearer than the rising? Or the, are they equally clear? Or are they equally obscure? Focus on clarity. Which is clearer? Which is less clear? Each of these movements, the rising and the falling, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Do you see the beginning of the rising movement? Do you see the point that it ends? Do you see the beginning of the falling movement? Do you see the point that it ends? Do you see the middle? Or are you missing parts? If you're missing bits, which bits are you missing? Look for beginning, middle and end.
as you do these exercises, getting into the details of the breathing, do you feel that you are interfering in any way with the breathing? If so, step back from the detail of the breathing and stop interfering. Watch the breathing. Don't do it. Just watch it. Or, if you feel that you can't help but interfere with the breathing, then watch the interference itself. Step back from that and just watch it. But now, take a further step back with the awareness and return your awareness to the sense of the whole body. Feeling the whole body. As you do this, do you feel any sense of ease or pleasure within the body? Take your awareness back to that sense of ease and just rest there in it and allow the energies and the movements to flow through the body without being hindered in any way. Step back into the ease and feel that. Now reflect on your experience during these exercises. Has your experience of the breathing changed in any way during the sitting period? If so, how?
Okay. Where did you find it? Where was it? In the valley, all the way, all the time? Stayed there pretty consistently? Everywhere? Moving around or, or, or so sometimes clear one spot, sometimes in another spot? Uh -huh. So upper body, generally upper body, but moving around throughout the upper body. Hmm. Method says look for the breathing in the abdomen, so lower body. Sometimes you find it there, sometimes you don't. The important thing is to go where it's clearest and to stay with that, with, to stay with the clarity rather than be fixated on any particular part of the body. What uh, directions did they travel in? What, was, what, what shape did they create? Forward and back. Hmm? Forward and back. So, what? Oh, yeah. yeah, horizontally. Really consistent throughout? Yeah, like a pendulum. Hmm. So consistently forward and back like a pendulum. Anybody get any strange shapes? Vertical circle. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Mm? Cone shapes. Yeah. If you get all sorts of strange shapes and forms, uh, it's quite interesting to to track them. Which one was clearest out of the two, out of the two movements? Rising was clearer? Yeah. How many people had falling was clearer? Hmm. How many people had no difference between them? Looks like most people found rising clearer than falling. That's generally the case. There's never, it's never universal. You never get everybody having the same kind of experience. And the experience that you have always changes. But often you do find that the falling tends to be less clear than the rising. Were you with the falling all the way or were you missing bits of it? Hmm? All the way? You're confident of that? So you f you could see the point where it ended. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. So you were you were moving ahead to the rising before the falling was finished. Yeah. Any, anyone else feel that they were missing the falling, parts of the falling? Yeah. 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 Mm. 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 Yeah. Sometimes dropping away in a fuzziness. Yeah. Yeah. Rising, falling are just code for whatever the movements are doing. So there's movement but no sensation? Yes. So there's like, I'm aware of the breath and there's still some, it's still like the body is still contracting at that stage, but the actual sensation of the breath is absent. When you say the sensation is absent, do you mean the sensation of the breath? Yes, the but sensation of the breath. But there's some sensation, because otherwise how would you know there's the movement? Sensation, yeah. It's the breath and the actual movement. Hmm. So Mm. Breath, diaphragm, ribs, these are just concepts. 
what we're interested in is the actual is the direct movement here of touch sensations, movement sensations. So if there's movement, then there's movement. There is movement, but, but it's a different movement from the movement when the actual there's a different moving there's a different feel to it. Yeah. Okay. So you've got two yeah. So there's, so there's two diff quite distinct kinds of feel to the movements, mm -hmm. depending on how you conceptualise it to be, whether it's mm -hmm. breathing or ribs or whatever. But two, two quite distinct different feels to it, mm -hmm. and it shifts from one to the other. Yeah, so yeah. So sometimes you do discover when you look closely that you're missing bits and this is very important because if you don't notice that you're missing bits but you think that you're following the breathing then what is it that you're following? Often what you're following is a concept of the breathing, an idea of it. Uh, and at that point, at that moment, it's like you slightly zone out because you're with the physical reality and then suddenly there's a shift and you substitute a concept, a vague, hazy concept and then at some point come back to the breathing. So it's like you've engineered a little mini-sleep in the middle of it. It's important, particularly for insight meditation, to be right clearly with the actual experience, whatever it is. If it's actual movement, it's just movement. If it's a concept, it's just a concept. But to be clear about that is quite important. But particularly with the exhalation, it's a danger area. You're using, there you're using the concept to direct awareness to particular aspects of the experience. If there's movement, there has to be direction. How can you have movement without direction? How is that possible? If there's two movements, there must be a beginning. There has to be. There must be an end. You can't have, you know, an inhalation that lasts 20 years. You know, it must end. So there must be an end. So the concept directs the awareness toward that. Am I seeing it or not? You may, with the concept, engineer a beginning and an end, which actually isn't there. That's always a danger. But it must be there. And either I'm seeing it or I'm not seeing it. But it has to be there, surely. So the concept is about aim directing the awareness in a certain area. Look for this. And you either find it or not, you don't have to find it, but you're sending the awareness somewhere. So you're learning to direct awareness, and in this case to be more precise with it. So is it not possible to um, get there without using concepts for us? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it is, yeah, it, you, you, you can get there without the concepts, but often people don't. Often you find that, that your relationship to the breathing is very vague. Mm -hmm. One of the things about meditation practice is when we begin a meditation practice, we don't know how to do it, right? Because we've never done it. And then we start immediately doing it. And so, of course, we make mistakes. Often we, we do it in a sloppy kind of way. But then we just get used to that. We just assume, well, this is the way you do it and you can be repeating the same old 
kind of sloppy mistakes for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And so at some point, you kind of go back and realise, well, wait a minute, what am I doing? Oh, I'm doing this. Well, maybe I, should, I shouldn't be. Maybe I should be doing that. And that's how, that's the, how the learning process takes place. You start to see the things that I was, I was missing, the things that I was doing, doing wrong. Often, in this case, the things that I was missing, what I'm not seeing in the experience. Because the meditation requires energy and precision. So these exercises are essentially exercises in, in precision, being more precise, like when we did the um, yesterday, working with the elements. Essentially, it's about precision. You're directing awareness in a, in a certain direction in order to be more precise with it. And that precision is very important, particularly with insight meditation. What? Hmm? If you were to have a balloon effect, obviously when the balloon fills up, it's having a sensation because there's more air there. Mm -hmm. And as the air moves out, then if you were touching it with your fingers, you make it very subtle. Mm. So it's that subtleness that you're losing at the end. Yeah. Because there's not much air there. Yeah. It yeah. It becomes increasingly subtle. Certainly on the exhalation, it tends to be very subtle. Not necessarily, but it can be. And it's the subtlety that we miss. And that's because there's not much air there. Uh, could be, yeah. Air, air element is weak. Right. That air element is weak at that particular time. But as the meditation progresses, you do get into progressively more subtle areas, both in body and in mind. And if you, if you train yourself in precision, you can stay with it, even though it's very subtle. You can stay with it. But otherwise, at some point, you just start to zone out. And then at that's, that's where you get blocked. At that point, you don't go any further. Because you can't, because it's too subtle for you. It's too, too refined, and you can't go there. So, yes, it, in certain circumstances, and you can see it, in, in this case, you're seeing it in the exhalation, the experience becomes more subtle, more refined. So, can I keep up with it? Or not? That's the question. It's like a pause. It seems like there's a pause. You're not ready to move in. You're not really feeling it. It's the end of the It feels more like a pause on the exhalation. Mm. Yeah, that's something that we didn't actually look at. Is there a gap between falling and rising? Between rising and falling? If so, what happens in the gap? To answer that question, again, you have to be precise. You have to be really alert to what's going on. Did anybody find that background sense of ease that I was talking about? Ease as in a sense of being at ease, just being peaceful and still. I find it uh, difficult because um, connected to breathing without manipulating it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became pretty good over the years to follow the breath and I'm very aware what is happening. But each time it makes me kind of agitated and yeah, a bit tense maybe. So did you feel that you were interfering? Yeah. 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 Could you step back from that and not interfere? Was that what possible? What I do now is I, um, like I hang myself a little bit on the, um, on the noise or on, on sound and from there it's more easy to um, watch it but then of course I'm not so precise mm. yeah so if you try to be precise you find you start to interfere yeah. but if you step back from it you can't be precise you're not interfering but you, you can't be precise yeah. if you notice that when you go into the breathing to be precise it starts to get really agitated, yeah. then you, you can see that the, 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 there's too much energy being put into it. And so you have, what you need to do is to step back and let that energy settle down. But then you do sacrifice precision. But what to do? That's what you have to do. 
don't worry about precision in this case because if you start getting concerned about precision, then you may end up putting too much energy in again. So don't worry about it. Just notice any interference and any agitation. And as soon as you notice it, step back from it. Uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Again, there's, there's rules of thumb, but there's no absolutes in this, in this practice because it's a, a live thing. Sometimes you discover that you can't precisely watch, you can't, you can't watch breath without interfering in some way. That's a very common experience. People start to notice. As soon as I watch it, it changes. In, in other words, I'm interfering with it. Some people can't effectively use breath as a meditation object unless they interfere. Because if you have a very shallow breath, then they can't, they find they can't hook onto it and they just fall asleep again and again and again. So the only way that they can stay with the breath and alert is by making it somewhat artificial. A very common way is to emphasize the exhalation, lengthen the exhalation and allow the inhalation to just happen. Lengthen the exhalation, just allow the inhalation to happen. Otherwise, they can't, they can't use breath as a meditation object. But other people find that they go into the breathing, they notice there's an interference, and over time, that gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and it starts to really distort the breathing. And the breathing becomes really, really strong. There's, there's an agitation, and so on. And so if that happens, then you know you, this is no good. So you've got to step back from it and have a whole different relationship to the breathing. So the kind of relationship you have to the breath depends on individual factors. So in, when, it, in the morning, while well, I'm tossing out these exercises, but they don't necessarily apply to everyone. They're experiments. You try them and see what happens. Yeah. Mm. Deeper and it becomes more obvious. Yep. Yeah. And then I can let that go and it seems to almost change the rhythm for quite a while. Uh-huh. And if I settle down, if I notice something else, when I've held it and my breathing has stopped, then I become quite tuned in to the throbbing in my body. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a secondary it's pulse yep. with my heart. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people often find when they tune into the heartbeat that it's very strong. And you can also... See, the other thing is when we talk about breathing, making breath a meditation object, what are we talking about? For example, in Mahasi I would say, follow the breathing in the abdomen. Well, obviously we don't breathe in the abdomen. We breathe in the lungs. The word for that translated as breath is prana, which is the same as the Sans- Sanskrit prana, which is the same as the Chinese qi. Uh, what we're tuning into in breathing meditation is air element, is the energy flow throughout the body. And it's not simply in the lungs, it's throughout the entire body and beyond. So we've confined it anywhere. The breath, in the conventional sense of the breathing, is simply a gateway into this. It's not the really the object itself. It's bigger than that. It's this whole flow of energy throughout the body, which is why we can, you can find it anywhere, and why it does all sorts of the, these really weird things. Because the energy flows throughout the body, go in all sorts of directions. So, in your case, you can tune into another aspect of the energy throughout the body in terms of this internal throbbing. That's another aspect of prana. And you know, one thing leads to another, so as you as you found. So don't get hung up on the concept of the breathing. What we're working on is bigger than that. Um, with the concentration on the breath, 
Yep. becomes quite intense. So then we move into the sense of ease. And then it could have a tendency to become tranquility meditation. So it changes from mindfulness to... Emphasizing ease is shifting actually towards the serenity side. Yeah. Uh, if you find that sense of ease, you're moving closer towards the serenity side. Whether you're doing serenity or whether you're doing insight, mindfulness is very important. In both cases, you're using mindfulness. That sense of ease can be, you know, particularly in insight meditation, can be very useful if you find that there's, for any reason in the meditation, there's agitation or distress building up in some way and you need to back out, back out of it and, and step out from it. Then being able to find that sense of ease within the body is quite useful. Oh well, why not? <laughs> so, so long as you stay alert with it. There's nothing wrong with enjoying yourself in, as you meditate. Yeah, actually, I think it's an important principle that we enjoy the meditation. Uh, this is something that I mean, insight is, can be very be very dry and, and very relentless. Uh, so anything you can do to sweeten it is quite good. But always staying alert, staying watchful to what's going on. So you find there's, first of all, there's a lot to see with the breathing. It's not just in, up, in, up, in, up, in, up. There's more to it than that. Sometimes it's appropriate to really go for the detail, to be as precise as you can. And uh, you do that uh, when you can. Sometimes you can't, either because you haven't got enough energy, because it, it takes a fair bit of energy to do that, or because you've got too much. And if you go into that kind of detail, it starts to get too agitated. If you've got too much energy, you step back and just get a sense of the whole field and rest within that. Sometimes if there's not enough energy, you, you, you drop the breathing altogether as a meditation object and go to something else like physical sensation. So different strategies work at different times. But the, the, uh, the main thing is that when you work with breathing, recognize there's a lot happening there. So really start to explore the whole field and open it out. Especially remembering that by breath we mean the entire energy f flow throughout the body. And our sense of inhalation, exhalation is really just a gateway into that. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, is there a disadvantage or advantage to, between the seven methods, like uh, connecting with the sound or connecting with the breathing? Uh, um, as a meditation primary object. Ah, as a primary object. Yes. Um, both of them have advantages and disadvantages. They're both good primary objects. Uh, it depends on what you can hook up to, what you can successfully use as a primary object. The purpose of the primary object is to sustain attention over time. So if you've got something that you can find and stay with over a period of time, it's a good primary object. So for some people, for example, use sound as a primary object, and it's very good for them. Other people, they can't use it at all. They can't possibly use it as a primary object because they just can't hold it for any period of time. For some people, breath is a very good primary object. For other people, it's, it's hopeless. So it, it just depends on your own experience. Yep. Mm-hmm. Just take, uh, have a, a general sense of being as precise as possible. Um, shape and direction are very good to stay with. And also to check, am I getting the beginning, the middle and the end? Mm. 
then well if it's short that means they're happening very quickly and so just beginning and end yeah, yeah so in that, in that case you wouldn't worry about middle but yeah but beginnings and ends are very good one of the aspects about insight meditation is it's very much focused on impermanence now impermanence means things change which means things begin and other thing, things end and something ends and something else begins so as a general rule in insight meditation you're always directing yourself towards points of change where one thing begins and another thing ends now one obvious example of that is the beginning and the end of inhalation exhalation but it could be more subtle the beginning and the end of my awareness of the breathing the beginning and end of distraction the beginning and end of a sound the beginning and end of a movement the beginning and end of a thought and so on so looking for beginnings and ends points of transition where one thing becomes another that's always of interest if you're doing insight meditation that one place to practice that is with the breathing because you do get very clear beginnings and ends with the breathing any other questions yeah Trudy prana yeah yeah it's changing all the time Yep. Um, yeah. Any for, by the, what the Buddha means by impermanent, he means subject to change. So does it change? Is it different now than what it was before? Well, if it is, then it's impermanent. Um, yeah, right now it's happening. There's prana, right now. So in that sense, it's the same. But that's a very conceptual sense. Is the actual experience the same, or is it different? Well, it's intensified and sometimes, you know, it's a not prana. Yeah, but that's, isn't that thinking? Concepts, concepts are very stable but when we actually when we go to an experience we find that it's moving, shifting even the experience of making the concept is moving and shifting the concept creates a world of solidity and stability but when we look at the actual experience itself does it change or not? Anyway, I think it's, speaking of change, time for walking meditation. <laughs>